Well, welcome everyone. It's good to see everybody. And uh, for those watching on video, welcome. I'm glad you are here. And uh, particularly Ty and Amanda in Labrador City, uh, just starting up their journey home church. Uh, welcome and, uh, and glad you have this opportunity to share with us as we sort of break open God's Word and look at one of the most uh, rich texts in the entire Bible. Uh, that connects some of the greatest ideas and thoughts about God and who God is um, with our lives and our hearts and, uh, and the deep emotional realities that we uh, live every day. It connects us with um, the deep parts of ourselves, connects us to uh, ancient Israel, and, the, and we see the humanity that we share. Uh, it's always interesting. Sometimes we see people far away and uh, we think, oh, well, so different than us. But you read the Psalms and we're disconnected both geographically and we're disconnected in time. And yet we read the Psalms and we realize that much of the human struggle that, uh, and, and joy and all of these emotions that we see in the Psalms, they are also the very same things that we deal with, live with, struggle with, or just simply exude in our own um, relationship with God and walk through life. Um, I'm really excited about this particular series, it's, and I hesitate to call it a series because it, the Bible Project is one of those ongoing things that we do throughout our ministry year. Uh, the last time we did it, we looked at um, Paul's letter to Ephesians, and we, we went through it chapter by chapter. Um, obviously, um, with 150 Psalms and Psalm 119 actually having uh, something like 176 verses, um, we're not going to be able to do a Psalm by Psalm, verse by verse exposition of, of what the Psalms are saying. But I do believe over the next seven weeks, we can grab hold of some of the central ideas and central things that the Psalms teach us as we follow the Lord Jesus. And I'm excited about um, this particular series because also the Psalms are, I think, really essential for the church. Um, they teach us so much about worship and about how we need to be real before God. So often, um, I think, in our evangelical Christian culture, we, we want to deny uh, some of the, the deep feelings that we have uh, when we go through life. And the Lament Psalms remind us, and we're looking at a Lament Psalm uh, this weekend, but they remind us that it's okay. God knows everything. We accept that. We know that God is all-powerful. We accept that, and we wrestle between those two things sometimes. But often in our churches, we feel like we can't talk about the dark valleys that we go through in life. Or if we do talk about it, we always have to be triumphant. We always have to be, um, you know, just a couple of seconds on the struggle and then all kinds of talk about faith and hope and, and joy. But those of us who have gone through dark, dark valleys, whether it be um, loss of a loved one, uh, loss of a dream, uh, loss of employment, uh, just the fears of the future, uh, and you're in that oh, betrayal, <laughs> as we see in Psalm 13, uh, we see the, the, the deep darkness that the human soul goes through. And sometimes it's hard to even, even though you may have a disciplined prayer life and you get up regularly and pray, some, sometimes in those darkest moments, you can't even put words together to talk to God. And who do you talk to when in our churches we can't actually identify that as a reality? We say, oh no, oh, that's a lack of faith or you must be a weak Christian. When actually you're just feeling the immense weight of reality in that moment. And what you'd really like is someone to just sit with you and listen or say, and maybe say nothing or maybe just bring a psalm to you, and you read it, and you understand that you're not the first person who went through that dark valley. Long ago, others have gone through the same thing. I think of Jesus on the cross when he cries out. Obviously, he's quoting from the psalms. He's memorized them, but yet they're his own experience as well from the cross. 
And often as we go through the Psalms, we can, when we are in that place where we have no words ourselves, we can pull the words of the Psalms and we can make them our own. And we can pray through the Psalms. And we can repeat the words, if you will. But they're not just the words of the Psalm, they're also the words of our heart as we go through it. I had the opportunity um, to sit down uh, this last week with uh, Steve Dempster, and we, we were talking about Psalm 13. You know, you never sit, live, miss an opportunity when you're sitting down with an Old Testament scholar to sort of, you know, reach around that noggin of theirs and try to get, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, extra info. Or, uh, and, and Psalm 13 was a, a very uh, special psalm to him. But uh, one of the things he shared with me about the Psalms in general is that he said, the Psalms are a companion for our journey. And I thought, wow, that's a great expression. The Psalms are a companion for our journey. And um, I know for me, uh, just turning 50 this last year, uh, I wish that maybe in my 20s I had learned that (laughs) so that I would have read them more and struggled through them more and integrated some of those ideas and those prayers into my own life. So that instead of having these spells where I didn't know what to say and maybe didn't say anything to God, I could have at least taken the Psalms and let them speak for me. Now we may not be able to preach through every Psalm in the next seven weeks, but one thing we can do, and I'm gonna challenge you to do this, is uh, if you have a handout, you'll notice that one of the little uh, graphics in there is for the version. Uh, we do this live event uh, on version, but also version is great for reading plans. I mean, it's a free online Bible. Um, you can use it on your device or your computer. Um, wouldn't it be great if we just said over the next seven weeks we were gonna all as a congregation, uh, whether, wherever you are, um, to read through the Psalms, to actually immerse ourselves in in that, those prayers from ancient Israel. The prayers uh, of the Psalms that Jesus himself read and memorized. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could sort of enter into that world so over the next seven weeks as we look at these um, uh, sort of major uh, points through the Psalms, we all had a sense of the, of the worship and of the, the God who is behind these Psalms. As we look at Psalm 13, um, it is a song that's for the suffering. Uh, and it, we, it's a psalm, I mean, it's a hymn, it's a, it's a prayer, it's, it's everything in there, right? It's one of those ideas that, um, I guess it's like a worship song in the sense that they're, they often are written in the, uh, uh, you know, directly to God. So they represent a, a song, you could sing it. Um, we don't, may not know the tune, and maybe if we heard the ancient tune, we, we, it may not be pleasant to our ears in our culture. But, um, but the point is, is that it's a prayer, and I don't know about you, but, uh, and this is maybe a mark of me getting older, but when you, all of a sudden, if you hear a melody sometimes, like an old tune from the past, like back in the 80s or 70s, for some of you, that, that's way too far back. But, uh, you know, and you hear the first word, all of a sudden, I know my wife and I, we just, all of a sudden, we have all the lyrics there. We're, we know the, the words. You know, I can't remember a shopping list that I wrote out five minutes before, but I can still remember the lyrics to... Uh, uh, you know, um, Sweet City Woman or some crazy song from the 70s, right? Uh, songs have a tendency to just get in there. They, uh, they, they just get right into our memories and our, and our thoughts, and we connect them to different events going on in our lives. And uh, the psalms are like that. They, they are such an integrated part. They're sung. They're recited. They're prayers. They're songs. They're, they're all of that. And Psalm 13 reminds us of this idea of lament. You know, Walter Brueggemann, Old Testament scholar, uh, wrote an article back in the 80s called The Costly Loss of Lament. And he spoke back then about how when we in the church lose our idea, this idea, the acceptability, if you will, of lament, that it affects other parts of of our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. First of all, it creates within us a false self because we're actually taking a whole part of our lives and saying that God's not in that. 
I'm feeling the darkness of this moment in my life. I feel like I can hardly breathe because of the pressure upon me and the, and the terrible experiences I'm having right now. And because we can only do joy and happy things in church, right? Uh, I have to somehow take that and separate it from my faith in God and then only think happy thoughts. And of course, when you're feeling in that deep darkness, that's a very difficult thing to do. In fact, you become a hypocrite because you're not actually expressing who you really are. You're expressing a false self. And we get so used to that that we don't even identify any longer with this, the need to, to, com to ask questions of God. God, why? Why is this happening to me? The first thing I ha that happened to me when I woke up uh, last, I think it was last week, and I heard that Nepal had a second earthquake, as I just said, really, God? Really? I mean, one was awful, but two? I mean, if we can't take the deep, deep misgivings we have with the things that we see in the world and relate that back to God and say, God, what's going on? Where are you? We're missing out on a part of, our, of being honest to God. You know, we don't have to worry about hurting God's feelings. And we don't have to worry about protecting him. And we're feeling it. He already knows that we feel that way. We need to be more like David and, and various writers in these Psalms who cry out to God in their distress and say, God, where are you? Why are you hiding your face from me? How long, Lord, will this pain just go through me? They're being real. They're being honest. And instead of hiding it away in a closet somewhere and pretending it doesn't exist, they bring those concerns to the one that they love most in the world, to their God. And they ask the questions where they really ought to be asked, to God. Those of us who have experienced um, deep despair or grief understand um, how much our hearts want to cry out to God and ask why. And we understand the pressure of not really feeling the freedom to do that. Uh, when I was having breakfast with Steve, he mentioned a family who came to a church and, and everybody, everything was joyful and happy and everything was, everything was just great and the songs were upbeat and everything was wonderful, but they had just lost a child and they sat at the back and they, after about 10 minutes, so they just had to leave. They couldn't, they couldn't take it. They, they couldn't take the happiness <laughs> because they weren't happy. And sometimes we need to understand that that there is a place for grief and sadness too. And as we come to the Psalms, we see that this is, uh, it's not even an unusual space within our life with God. Disappointment comes at various times in life, sometimes when we least expect it. And Psalm 13 reminds us that it's okay to say, how long, O Lord, Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? It's Gerald Wilson, his commentary on um, the Psalms, he writes, the questions at issue here are not simple requests for knowledge, but express deep human misgivings about the character and activity of God and their effect on human life. He's being honest, and he's taking it to God. The second thing that Brueggemann mentions in his article is that we, we become people who just focus on the good and the wonderful, and so when we see things that are actually unjust or unjust, we, we end up actually try, turning a blind eye because we have no capacity to deal with things that aren't as they ought to be. We have no vocabulary for that because all we want to do is sing happy songs. 
And and when we see things that shouldn't be, when we see injustice in the world, we run away from it instead of into it. Because we don't want to be reminded of that. And there's no place for that kind of thinking and feeling in our spiritual lives. We need to be a people that actually understand that while we serve in the kingdom of God, we serve in the kingdom of God within the larger context of a fallen world where there still is injustice, where light needs to be shined, and where it's okay for us to weep for those who things are happening to which should, they should never happen. One of the things that I uh, truly appreciate about, appreciate about Pastor Dave and his connection with World Vision is it really, it really his serving on the board really, for me at least, as I, as I see him and, and know him, it, it really captures two things that I think really make him uh, significant in, uh, as, a, as a leader here and, and just as a person. And the first is, is that, um, is that he's, he's around the, some of the best leaders in Canada, uh, learning leadership and offering leadership. And, uh, and I know he just thrives on that because as a part of the staff here, even though I'm only here 16 hours a week, uh, the, the, the thing is, is that I know that, that he actually gets excited to see my leadership grow. <laughs> He, he would look back when I first started here and he'd look at me now and he, he, would be, he would be excited at the growth and leadership that's happened because of being surrounded by great leaders and taking leadership training and taking risks. And, and he pushes himself and puts himself into that context as well. But perhaps for me, the more significant thing is, is that um, Pastor Dave has a great love and a great heart uh, for the least of these. And, uh, you know, going to a place uh, like Nicaragua or uh, where some of the places in Ethiopia, I guess, started the whole process, he just had a, something profound happen in him where he couldn't just turn away. You can't just turn your eye away. You have to look into it and say, Some, we have to do something. <laughs> we have to do something. And when you were allowed to actually cry out to God and say, why God, why is this happening? How long will you hide your face? Something happens within us and we grab a hold of the situation. We don't run away from it to try to get happy again. It's okay to feel the the tension between the great good news of the gospel of Jesus and a world that's still aching and often dark with evil. And it takes, I think, all of us, it takes us to to grab leadership in our own lives and over our own lives to press against our culture, our, our happy thought culture, and actually grab a hold of some of these things and embrace lament. And also embrace how lament turns around, because in the Psalms, it's really remarkable that, for the most part, anyway, they always come to that last stanza where there is a declaration of hope and confidence that God will come through. <laughs> you know, they're not feeling it, maybe, but, but there, there is this declaration, this choice that is made about how they understand God, and they know that God will, will do something. And, I mean, someone will quickly say, well, what about Psalm 88? But you know what? Psalm 88, absolutely. No happy ending there, right? But it sort of stands alone. I mean, I think it's there. It's kind of like the thief on the cross in a sense, you know? I mean, one of these bedside conversions. It's, it can happen, but there's only one example, right? I mean, it's, a, you know, don't make that a strategy for your life. You know, yeah, sure, you, it can happen, but uh, it's, it's not normal. And, and Psalm 88, it, uh, it really jumps out at us as being uh, bleak, uh, but also um, not normal, regardless of what some modern scholars would tell us, that, you know, that it is normal and everything else has just been tweaked to make it look better. It's actually not that way. This is the one psalm that sort of stands out and says, oh, something's missing. Where is that happy little stanza at the end? And we look for it, and it's not there. 
But you know, when you're in the midst of it, uh, sometimes that's exactly how it feels. The, the, even, the, the, even that little ray of light peering into the darkness, you just can't find it. You can't see it. You can't feel it. And so there it is in our, in our canon, reminding us to be humble towards those who are struggling in their, in their dark valley and not to, you know, give them swift kicks and try to accelerate them so that we feel comfortable, but to actually journey with them. But likewise, it's just one. And other laments have their conclusion as a confident hope in God for God's goodness. And I think the, part of the reason for this is just the biblical logic that suffering does have the power to destroy us. Uh, if we get stuck there, if we decide, you know what, I'm going to camp out here, I'm going to build a tent here, a little cottage here, and just make it my, my place where I'm going to live. And all we see now is the darkness. All we see is the, the depth of our pain. And we never, ever even have a hope for something better. It actually can eat us up. It can eat us up. Suffering truly can uh, erode our souls if we don't um, have an eye of faith in the middle of it, in the midst of it. And it may be the minority part. I mean, these laments, I mean, they're primarily just uh, questions about God and uh, disappointment with God and saying, God, what are you doing? I don't understand it. The majority of the psalm is that. And then you have this sort of final stanza which flips it around, you know. And it's okay if that's what it is, if you just have a smidgen of that confident hope and a, and a whole well of I'm feeling really awful right now. That's Okay. The lament psalms remind us that we're not the first persons to worship God and to struggle with a fallen world. But just as we know that um, the suffering can really destroy us if we decide to dwell there, the lament psalms also remind us that, um, that when we make a choice to trust in God's goodness. Something happens in our soul, literally in our soul, that creates hope. It's, um, there's a need for honest reflection, but there's a need to hold on to the concept that God is the God of all comfort. That even as we experience the, you know, the dark night of the soul, as it's been called, We need to keep an eye toward the goodness of God. And in fact, that can be part of our struggle. God, you're good. I believe that. How come this is happening? That can be part of our struggle. In fact, it is. I'm thinking in Psalm 13, that's part of David's concern. Uh, God is good. God made promises to him. Now he's stuck out. Uh, he's been kicked out of the, the city. He's, uh, you know, if this is related to Absalom, then you know, his own son has rebelled against him. Uh, his enemies are, are seeking to destroy him. Um, well, there's a couple of times in David's life where that could be true, I'm sure. But, but the reality is, is that you know, he, he has this idea of who God is, but how can this be happening because of that? And that's what creates the tension. But look at the end of Psalm 13. But I will trust in your unfailing love. And I I look at these um, futures here as being sort of declarative. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. It is a declaration of something which will happen It's a choice that is being made. I trust in your unfailing love. David trusted in God's unfailing love, even in the midst of um, complete and utter chaos in his life. You know, you may be in a place in your life, um, or maybe you're just sort of coming out of that, or maybe you're just entering in where you're wondering, God, what are you doing? What's going on? I would encourage you to be honest with God. Don't shut down that part of your heart and just sort of try to become numb to it. It's okay 
to question what's going on. It's okay when you're in the midst of something which feels awful and dark to say, God, where are you in this? How long will I have to go through this? And in the midst of that, remember David's conclusion in verses five and six. I will rejoice, I will sing because I trust in God's unfailing love. And that becomes an anchor for us to hang on to in the midst of some disturbing and difficult and even agonizing points in our lives. It was just this last spring that my stepdad died and um, he was only uh, early 60s, just retired. He had retired on Thursday, died on Saturday, and um, and I got news. My mom called me and let me know, and obviously that was a great sadness. He was uh, he was my stepdad, but uh, he had been my grand the grandfather to my kids. He had been in the, our lives that, all that time, and and I, I truly loved the man. He was a a kind kind man, and he loved my mom. And then to hear news that my mom, uh, just with the stress of uh, of of that death, her heart went into failure, and and I was sat there that night, thinking, God, I can't lose both. Where are you? And of course, I've seen enough suffering as a pastor to know that there are a lot of people who've lost a lot more than two people at once. Entire busloads of people. Uh, There have been entire families uh, devastated with accident. And I knew that I wasn't special (laughs) in that sense, that things that affect others can affect me. And so logically I'm saying I have nothing to say and complain about God because I'm just experiencing life the way everyone experiences life and God will be comfort to me. That's my sort of brain side. But my heart is screaming out and just beating in my chest, God, where are you? And you may be in one of those places. And I think that's the essence of lament. Our hearts cry out from the depths of our pain and then we have that glimmer of of who God is and we just hang on to that I will rejoice I will sing I trust in your unfailing love I thank God the story that uh, that I was going through ended well my mom recovered um, she apparently had broken heart sur- uh, broken heart syndrome I'd never heard of that before I wish I had but um, I've heard of it now It sounds like something out of a grim fairy tale or something, but apparently it's real. But where will you go when you're experiencing the deep darkness in life? When everything that you hoped for is falling apart and everything that you desire, you're not seeing any fruit of that. I think the Psalms challenge us, even in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our, that sense of, of anguish to come back to him and to trust, to make a choice to trust him, even in the midst of it. As Paul would say, hope against hope. There's no reason for it, maybe, but it becomes a choice that we make. If you look in your um, handout, if you have one, and if you don't have one and you're watching online, you could probably download that. Might be a good idea. There's questions in there and all kinds of great stuff. We've got a great communications team. Team of what, one, Nancy? <laughs> two, okay, team of two. But you'd never know it from looking at it. It's absolutely incredible, incredible stuff. But in, the, in that, it says, it just asks this simple question and I wanna conclude with this simple question. This week, what will you choose? Will you choose to believe only in your present circumstances? 
or will you choose to believe God's promises to you in Christ? And I think what that question highlights is that ultimately we all make a choice. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of anguish, we all have to make a choice about what's going to come next. And we read in David's psalm here, he chose to trust in God's unfailing love. And it's my hope and it's my prayer that while you struggle with the real reality of suffering, of anguish, of difficulty, whatever it may be that you're going through, and if not now, and if you're in a happy place, take that and rejoice, because there's lots of psalms in, the, in there uh, all about that too. But it's about the whole gamut of experience in human life. And if you happen to find yourself in a place where you're just feeling the anguish of it all, I hope, I pray, I challenge to trust in God's unfailing love, even as David did, and to declare as David did, I will rejoice, I will sing, because God has made promises to me and God will make good on his promises. Choose to believe God's promises to you in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you and we thank you for the incredible depth of this song book, this prayer book, uh, the Psalms. We thank you that, we thank you for all of Scripture. We thank you that it's been preserved for us and we can learn and grow and be enriched in our lives because of it. Um, but God, these psalms, they just hit us in a special way. They touch us both intellectually and in our hearts. And they pull it all together for us. And God, as we read Psalm 13, we're reminded that, it, uh, that you are with us even when you feel far, far away. That we cry out into what seems like an, an abyss, and yet you are there. And you hear our words. And we don't have to feel it. And God, we thank you for that. I pray, God, for your mercy on our lives that we would have the capacity in the midst of that darkness to choose to trust in your unfailing love. Teach us in the good moments of life just how beautiful you are, just how awesome you are, just how trustworthy you are, so that in those dark times, we have a deposit of you in our lives that we can hang on to and will give us hope. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.